I think we'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Hello, and welcome to Track 4, Science and Technology Innovation. My name is Tammy Johnston from Ambry Genetics, and I'm excited to be hosting this morning breakout Track 4 session. As a reminder, this track is being live streamed, and I would like to welcome our remote attendees and remind everyone that it's not too late to download our mobile app and use some of our highlighted features like live Q&A. Uh, this session is all about enzyme replacement therapy, and speaking on this topic, I would like to welcome Steve Marisich, a medical director at Biomarin Pharmaceuticals, uh, followed by Mark Dant, president and CEO of the National MPS Society. Welcome. So, first uh, things first, we're going to switch up the order. I'm Mark Dant, and I'm the President and CEO of the National MPS Society. Oops. We shouldn't have switched the order. Now, uh, I'm going to have to do your slides and vice versa, so wish me luck. Yeah. Okay, we're ready. So, start over. My name is Mark Dant. I'm the President and CEO of the National MPS Society. We're based in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. We support uh, 12 different syndromes. And of those 12 syndromes, there are treatments for just, just a few. So, uh, we have over 1,500 family members, and our, our, our touch is to, to walk with the families as their journey start to finish with this uh, such a rare disease. So. I've been asked to kind of give the history of enzyme replacement therapy. So I thought the first thing to do is show this picture. Believe it or not, that is me. And uh, if, if you go all the way back to the beginning, 1964, and you're supposed to look really confused because this picture should not look like it was taken in 1964. <laughs> but in 1964, a great researcher at uh, NIH called Roscoe Brady discovered that a specific enzyme missing uh, can be found in the disease called Gaucher. From 64 to 66, Dr. Brady continued to work on it and found that in 1966, the enzyme missing in Gaucher can be found in human placebos, I mean placentas. So from 66 to 73, Dr. Brady continued his work to, to work to find and develop that enzyme that could be found in human placentas. In 73, he, he injected a few humans. But what he found was the enzyme didn't last very long. And so the effect wasn't what he wanted it to be. So he continued to work from 73 to 81. And in 1981, he met two individuals, Henry Blair and Henry Shamir. These two very important individuals in rare disease, what we would look back and find, started a company called Genzyme. Genzyme partnered with Dr. Brady at NIH, and in 1983, a young man at the age of three years old uh, and his mom met Dr. Brady, Brian Berman. Brian Berman's mom was a physician. She closed the doors of her practice and began volunteering for Dr. Brady at the NIH because he was working on something that would save her son. In 1984, four-year-old Brian Berman was injected with the first infusion of enzyme replacement therapy made from Dr. Brady's work on human placentas. The good news is, it worked. Brian, after seven infusions, was, was really improving. But what was, the bad news was it was too difficult to make, and the lab was not able to produce enough enzyme for Brian to move forward. Forty placentas for one infusion. As Brian would grow, more placentas. 22,000 placentas for one year. And so from 1987 on, Dr. Brady and those individuals from Genzyme worked to try to raise some funds. Brian's mom helped Dr. Brady and Henry Tamir and Henry Blair raise some funds, $10 million. That was enough to get a trial started. In the 1991, from 87 to 91, trials began to expand. Twelve individuals all began treated to get, begin treatment. 
And in 1991, the FDA approved enzyme replacement therapy for Gaucher. The partnership of in the individual family companies in the FDA changed a life. So when we talk about the lives of the family, that's the purpose of the picture. If you look back at your own family, how many in the audience are married? You have to raise your hand. That's the rules. Remember the, the night of your wedding reception? And there were toasts. The toasts were to tomorrow, to your hopes, to dreams. Everything you want to come true, may it come true. That's what happened here. Jean and I were married in Louisville, Kentucky, where we both grew up. I'd already started my career in Dallas, came back home to get married. And that night, uh, we had the same toasts. The next day, we drove to Dallas. We laid out the future because, to us, the future was already in front of us. We knew exactly what we were going to do. I was going to continue my career. Jean would transfer to University of North Texas. When she got out and got a job in IT, well, then we'd, we'd buy a house. Then we'd get a dog. Then we'd have kids. I wanted five. Jean wanted three, so we compromised. We decided we would have three. April 13th, 1988, after we got the dog named Bonnie in the house, Ryan Christopher Dant was born. Eight pounds, 13 ounces. Happy, healthy, and as time grew, went on, so did Ryan. Ryan grew. Healthier, happier, loved baseball, loved everything. And we loved him. He was going to be the big brother to the other two kids we would have. When Ryan was three and a half, we took him to a preschool, a structured daycare, physical with this pediatrician. This pediatrician, Dr. William Coco, told Jean that Ryan's head is too large. His stomach is too large. Before Jean left, he made an appointment with Dr. Lou Weber at Dallas Children's Hospital. And Dr. Weber told Jean, Ryan may have this disease called MPS. When Jean told me this, I said, no, he doesn't. His head is too large. My head is too large. <laughs> His stomach's too large. It's genetic. And so I didn't go to that appointment. I didn't go to the next appointment when Dr. Weber took some urine and tested him again. But I did go back to the appointment where Dr. Weber was going to tell us, Ryan doesn't have MPS. He's just a large kid. What can you do if someone you love is diagnosed with a disease so hopeless and so rare Drug companies won't develop a treatment because it would never turn a profit. We might try doing what Mark Dant did. His little boy Ryan was one of only 40 babies in the United States born each year with a fatal genetic condition called mucopolysaccharidosis, or MPS1. Ryan and his wife Jean were told they could do little more than wait for their boy to die. But the Dants were not willing to accept that. Ryan's father embarked on a mission with only one goal, saving Ryan. Hi. Hi. Ryan was born in 1988, and from what his parents could see, was growing into a healthy, active toddler. Mark was on the police force, and Jean worked in the airline industry. Together, they were building a quiet, peaceful life in the suburbs of Dallas. <laughs> That is, until 1991, when Ryan turned three and a physician discovered his liver was abnormally large. Kids like Ryan with mucopolysaccharidosis 1 are missing an enzyme that the body needs to break down certain waste materials. Over time, the buildup damages organs like the heart, stiffens the joints, affects breathing, and stunts growth. In some cases, it can lead to severe brain damage and mental retardation. So I went with Jean to this appointment that would forever change our lives. Dr. Weber told us that Ryan wouldn't grow up, that Ryan would pass away by the time he was 10 or 12, and before he did, he would be in a lot of pain. There were more parts to that, to that discussion. Dr. Weber and I argued quite a bit. I said, Dr. Weber, you're saying that you know this for a fact, and he agreed it was, this is what was going to happen. Well, who's working on it? there's some scientist somewhere that's working on it. And he said, your son has a very rare disease. You, you don't understand. It's so rare, his title is an orphan disease. 
So no one really works on it because there are few, so few children like Ryan in the world. Well, there are companies that might step up and help develop a treatment. There are no companies because it's such a rare disease, companies cannot actually turn a profit, so they won't get into the market. I remember leaving, standing outside the door waiting for another appointment. But I remember nothing else until Jean startled me in the car. I was sitting in the driver's seat. She said, what are we going to do? I had no idea, but I know what we did do. We went home and closed the door. Every night, we put Ryan to bed. We'd sit in the living room and we'd watch nothing. We would wait. The next morning, I would wake up in the, sometimes in the middle of the night, and Jean wasn't laying next to me. She was laying on the floor next to Ryan's bed. Or she would wake up and I was laying on the floor next to Ryan's bed. And that was our future. We were laying on the floor waiting for nothing to change. If nothing changed, nothing changed. For a year, we waited. But then I started reading nonstop. What is MPS? What are they missing? I taught myself as much as I could about science. But I also learned everything Dr. Weber said was true. This was Ryan's future. We started a nonprofit. I read how to, do about, how to start your own nonprofit. It was called the Ryan Foundation. We had a great idea we were going to start with something really big. So we started with a bake sale. $342. It was huge. But for some reason that night when we went to bed, we felt better. We felt like we were actually going to make a change. We had no scientists. We had no company. We had no science. But we had hope. Because everything that we did from that point forward was to find that treatment, to change tomorrow to find what Dr. Weber told us we would never know again. Every one of us in the room, every one of us watching, has the same gift. The gift is, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We hope, we dream, we wish, but we don't really know. Dr. Weber and the diagnosis took that away. We knew. Meanwhile, Ryan's health continued to decline. He began having headaches so excruciating he would vomit and pass out. His fingers started to curl. At age seven, Ryan's hands got too stiff to play his favorite sport, baseball. To keep him in the game, his father attached Velcro to his bat. Eventually, even that didn't work, and Ryan had to quit the team. Mark still worked full time as both a cop and as Ryan's dad. Every day after walking the beat, he changed his uniform to walk another beat knocking on doors and shaking hands, nice to meet you. raising money to give to someone, How's it going? anyone, working on a cure. Over three years, the Ryan Foundation graduated from bake sales to $100,000 golf tournaments with Ryan as their poster child. Show you this? Yeah, it kind of shows Ryan's love for baseball. So we learned that with effort there was hope, but there were so many holes in the story. We had no scientist, we had no company, we had no science. So what do you do? You keep fighting. You keep realizing there's hope and effort. My wife worked for American Airlines, the job she got out of college. And at American, uh, we were allowed to fly wherever we wanted for free, which was very helpful. I learned of an international symposium on lysosomal storage disorders being held in Dusseldorf. There I met this amazing scientist from the NIH called Roscoe Brady. That was 1994. And he had just, uh, the Sarah Zyme, this is secret, second generation, had just been approved. And Dr. Brady told me everything that I had just talked about at the beginning of my talk had just occurred with the Gaucher. I had one of those great big cameras from the, old, from the 90s we had, old people have. And on it was a video of Ryan playing baseball at the age of four. And as he walked to his room, I stopped him. I said, Dr. Brady, you don't know who I am. But I live in Dallas. Here's my son. He has MPS1. And I watched him as he looked through the eye hole, and he watched Ryan rounding second and running. He said, he's very cute. And how old is he? I said, well, he's four. I said, can you do what you did for Gaucher for MPS1? And he said, well, let me ask you again. How old is he? And in a roundabout way, he told me very impo two, two very important things. He said, uh, you don't have enough money because it's going to take a lot of money. And you don't have enough time because Ryan's four. But it is possible. As I flew back to Chicago and then down to Dallas, I couldn't wait to see Jean because what I told her was the truth. And it reminded me of the great American film classic, Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> Remember when Jim Carrey wants to know if this girl's going to love him? And she said, there's a one in a million chance? Dr. Brady gave us hope. He said it was possible. So we doubled our efforts. We tripled our efforts, our efforts. And we waited and waited and looked everywhere for a scientist. 
Now, I'd read about a scientist named Dr. Elizabeth Neufeld, who in the late 60s said it was possible for MPS-1. But his biggest day came in 1995, when Mark met a young scientist at UCLA named Emil Kakis. Dr. Kakis was one of the few researchers in the world studying MPS-1, and his meeting with Mark Dant couldn't have come at a better time. You're almost ready to shut down? The research was stalled, and I, I still held out hope that we might be able to find some angel investor to come in and give us money and make it happen, but it was uh, very frustrating to feel that you had something that would be beneficial uh, for a disease that wasn't currently treated and couldn't do anything about it. So this is the lab where you actually do the research on the enzyme? Dr. Kakis had a sense that this complicated disease had a fairly simple solution. Create a synthetic version of the enzyme that's missing in kids who have MPS-1. This is what a normal healthy human body does naturally? Yes, normally your body makes these enzymes all by itself. They're helping everything run because your body is constantly building itself and breaking itself down. And one of those enzymes that's involved in that process is missing in MPS-1 kids. So by making it, we can help substitute for what they can't do themselves. The science was solid. But to take his synthetic enzyme from the lab to the bedside, Dr. Kakis needed money. And Mark Dant promised to provide it because he knew that time was running out for his son, who by the age of seven found even the simple act of breathing unbelievably difficult. I'm getting paced again. As Ryan fought for his life, Mark fought for money, eventually raising a total of a million dollars. He gave all of it to Emil Kakis. They basically decided to take all their money, you know, put all their chips on one number, which was us, and hope that their number would come up, and fortunately it did. Dr. Kakis attracted additional funding from a small biotech firm and had gotten FDA approval for a clinical trial of his synthetic enzyme treatment. Ten kids were chosen for the trial at Harbor UCLA Hospital in California. Ryan Dant was one of them. Well, guys, I think it's time to head towards the gate. In February of 1998, Ryan's neighbors gathered at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport for a big send-off. When I was at the airport, when I was about to get on the plane, everybody made um, uh, arch, and I went through it and went onto the plane. All the years of knocking on doors and holding bake sales had paid off, and as they boarded the plane, the dance finally had something to hope for. At the hospital, there remained the reality of a sick little boy. I need a wheelchair, Mom. Who spoke at the time about what he was getting ready to go through. I'm a little scared. He was tired of needles and doctors and feeling weaker and weaker every day. When is this gonna end? I just wanna go home because I don't like it here. I don't like to do all these tests. What's going to happen, that enzyme's going to circulate in your blood, in your body, going all over your body, and get to where it's needed to start breaking down the material that's there. Two months before Ryan's 10th birthday, Dr. Kakis and the dance administered the first dose of Ryan's enzyme treatment. Okay, ready? I'll bet $10 in one week you're going to feel better. Yeah. Ryan wouldn't take the bet, but it was a bet Dr. Kakis won. And he wasn't the only winner. Week by week, drip by drip, Ryan's life improved. There we go. One, two. Yay! And here he is today, at age 13, back in the game. A day his parents thought they might never see. Hey, that was a pretty good hit. Thanks. Before you started getting your treatment, could you hit like that? No. What were you like before? I couldn't hit the ball a lot. I couldn't actually run that fast. So you didn't have much energy? I couldn't bend my arms back. And you used to have headaches, your father told me. Terrible. How bad were they? Really bad. As bad as you can think. But the emotional pain often was worse. I was just getting scared coming up to that 10 years. 
So you actually knew there was a possibility before that you might die when you were 10? Yeah. Any thought about that? You worried about it? What'd you say to your, to your parents? It's gonna be okay. And now that you're on the treatment, what's happened to all those symptoms? Feels like I can do everything that I ever wanted to. Like, go ride my bike every day, or play baseball, basketball, you name it, I can do it. Except rock climbing. <laughs> <laughs> Which you probably shouldn't do anyway, yeah. right? <laughs> And Ryan wasn't the only one from the FDA trial to get better. All ten kids showed improvement. Time out. Results so impressive, they were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Thanks to the work of one visionary doctor and one determined family, these children now have something precious. Time. Time to await a cure and plan for a future that many thought would never come. Dr. Kack has taught us many things, and he continues to teach the right commu community things that truly does move the ball forward, not just with, with MPS, but with all rare diseases. He taught me that passion is not enough. He taught me that passion with urgency can move the ball. But if your passion leads you today to just think it's going to happen tomorrow, tomorrow's the day I'll get started, tomorrow never comes. Dr. Kack has taught us that if you continually work throughout the day to understand what your one goal is, is to treat to change the lives, to bring back that question that we all have. What's going to happen tomorrow? These 10 children did, did change the world. There's one missing from the, from, the photograph, from the photograph, but these 10 children did the same thing as those children did in the Gaucher Shea model, this Gaucher Shea trial, and the adults in that trial. They started the ball rolling for enzyme replacement therapies. They started to teach the rest of the world that industry and moms and dads and our government can partner and change the future. Vicki Mayberry made one, one very important statement at the, at the end of that piece. She said, these children now have something precious, time. Time to await a cure and plan for a future that many thought would never come. We were told Ryan's future was over. Every child with a rare disease, every adult with a rare disease is told the same thing. You no longer have that gift of not knowing what will happen tomorrow. I think that was good that my dad made a foundation to raise money and to help other kids to get medicine. You either, you have two feelings. You either have courage, you can get through it, or you take the other route that says, this is too much, I'm just, I'm giving up. You can go either way. And it just seemed to us, we would take the route where we say, no, we're not going to give up. We're just gonna keep working um, because we do that better than giving up. Probably some of the things that I've experienced since we last filmed that's been really fun is probably getting my driver's license, graduating high school, working for the Texas Rangers in a visiting clubhouse, and then getting this great job with SMU. I would say that he's, uh, you know, a 10 on a scale of 10. And uh, there's one thing I know, you can tell Ryan to do something and he gets it done. And, uh, you know, there, there's uh, something to be said for, for that, not just in the game of football, but in the game of life and in any job. And uh, Ryan is an accountable person. He's uh, got a smile on his face when you ask him to do something, and uh, he wants to get it done for you. That's how I try to live life. I don't like to tell too many people because I don't want to be treated differently. But when it's time to talk to people about it, I'll talk about it, but I just kind of keep a tiny little secret to myself because I don't want to be treated differently, any differently than a normal person. When we started more than 15 years ago, I met Ryan and met Mark and Gene. I had no idea where we we're going to go. I had hoped, I had hoped we could do something for him, prevent him from declining, keep him alive. I did not know where we would go in the end. Just being able to see how far we've come this past 15 years is amazing. Because not a day goes by that I wonder what life could have been like without this medicine. What my parents' lives could have been like without this medicine. What all the people around the world's life could be without this medicine. It's just really amazing and remarkable. 
be able to see all these parents from different countries send me messages on Facebook saying thank you for all this, the stuff you did when you were young because without you and everyone else that was part of that trial, we wouldn't be here today. By Marin and Genzyde partnered to bring this one enzyme replacement therapy around the world. Just like Brian Berman's parents, mom did with Dr. Brady and Genzyme, more companies now are doing the same thing. They're bringing hope around the world. I want to close with the reality that since uh, Brian's mom and Genzyme and Biomarin and Amylcacus brought forward treatments for enzyme replacement therapy, there are now in ERTs for MPS1, MPS2, MPS4, MPS6, MPS7s in the clinic, Gaucher, Fabre, Pompe, just to name a few. ERTs have, cha have changed the lives of tomorrow. They've brought it back to families like ours. I want to ask Steve now to present. Tell us how does this actually work? Because that's the part I never understood. All right. Well, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for in inviting me here to talk today. Um, so Mark did a great job of telling you why it is that we do what we do. Um, and now I have the uh, unenviable position of trying to tell you how it is that we do that. So the very first thing I want to start with is just what is an enzyme? Uh, and actually, I, I want to say too, if at any point anyone has any questions, feel free to, to stop me. I'm happy to have this be a, a really interactive um, thing rather than just me talking at you. So an enzyme, it, it's pretty simple. It's just a protein that your body makes that catalyzes some form of biochemical reaction. So for instance, uh, sucrose which is you know, just common table sugar. When you eat it, you have an enzyme in your saliva called sucrase that breaks it down into its component sugars of glucose and fructose. And this is important because your gut is much better at absorbing those sugars than it is at absorbing sucrose. So one way to think about enzymes um, is sort of like what, what they do is they really speed chemical reactions. So if you had a big block of ice, and you wanted to have it melt, you could walk outside the hotel over here and you could sit it on the pavement and you could wait for that to happen. Or you could get yourself a blowtorch and put it on the ice and it'll melt a lot faster. And that's exactly what enzymes do in the body. They speed up chemical processes that would normally be occurring at a very slow rate, but they enable them to happen at a rate that is compatible with life. So enzymes are found in different places within, within the body. And so if you think about the billions of cells that make up your body, each cell has certain components in it. And these little, some of them are, are little energy factories and some of them are waste disposal units um, and some of them do other sorts of processing. And so what I'm showing you here is there's a breakdown of the cell and then one of these organelles, these little components of the cell is called a lysosome. And there are a lot of different enzymes that are found in lysosomes. And for instance, the enzyme that's important for MPS1, or that, that whose deficiency leads to MPS1 is actually a lysosomal enzyme. And it turns out that there are a bunch of different lysosomal storage diseases. I think there have been over 50 that have been characterized at this point. So these enzymes hang out in the lysosome, 
and each one is specific for a certain substrate or a certain target. And in this case, um, I'm showing you uh, for a glycosaminoglycan, which is a, a sugar moiety that sits on the outside of, of proteins, this enzyme sulfatase does one specific thing. It takes that sulfur right there and cuts it off. And that's all it does. Now, this is important for, for two reasons. One is it helps you to see just how specific these things are, but two, in most cases, other enzymes or other proteins in the body can't substitute for that enzyme's action. So if you don't have that enzyme, then you've got a problem because there's no end around by which you could do what that particular protein is supposed to do. So this leads us, oh, sorry. Yeah, so the lysosome is inside the cell and then what happens is these enzymes that are in the lysosome that are normally breaking down different substances if you can't break them down, then what happens is they start to accumulate inside the, the lysosome. And I'll show you some pictures of that um, in, in a couple minutes. So enzyme deficiencies, or the lack or malfunction of some of these enzymes, lead to a whole host of different diseases. We talked about uh, lysosomal storage disorders. Uh, Hunter syndrome and Hurler syndrome are, are examples of that. What I work on, San Filippo syndrome, is another example of that. Um, peroxisomal disorders like Zellweger syndrome or X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. Mitochondrial disorders, Lee disease, Kern-Sayer disease. Um, these are diseases that affect that cellular uh, factory that is an, an energy and processing unit, and a number of different diseases. Now, if you look at any one disease by itself, very, very rare. But if you look at them in groups, they're actually surprisingly common. So for instance, lysosomal storage disorders, about one in 5,000 people have some form of a lysosomal storage disorder. Same is true for mitochondrial disorders. Proxosomal disorders, about one in 20,000. If you group all of these inborn errors of metabolism together, and you think about them as one big bucket, they don't qualify for a rare disease in any country because they're more frequent than one in 2,000 as a group. How do you end up with an enzyme deficiency? Well, almost all of these diseases are inherited by classical Mendelian genetics. And what does that mean? So on the left side over here of this slide, you can see all of the chromosomes. We have uh, 22 autosomal chromosomes and then one pair of sex chromosomes, either an X or a Y. And you get these chromosomes, you get one copy of each chromosome from each of your parents. Um, the sex chromosomes, if you're male, you get your X chromosome from your mom, Y chromosome from dad, and if you're female, you get an X chromosome from, from each of your parents. And so these deficiencies result from not being able to make the enzyme, and most of them are what's called autosomal recessive, meaning that you got two defective copies of these genes, one from mom and one from dad. Um, and examples of that, for autosomal recessive are morchio or a metachromatic leukodystrophy. Now you can also have what's called an X-linked disorder, which means that it's on the X chromosome. And as you might imagine, if you're male, you're way more susceptible to these kinds of diseases because you only have one copy of that X chromosome. So if you've got a defective gene from mom, then you're gonna be affected. As opposed to if you're female, there's through X inactivation and, and, other, um, and other processes you might not you might not see the manifestation of the disease. Um, an example of this kind of disease is X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. So the next question is, well, why do these diseases, or how do these diseases actually, or deficiencies actually cause disease? Well, as I told you, most of the time, enzymes are very, very specific, and their action cannot be substituted by some other process within the cell. And this can lead to two different buckets of problems. The first is a loss of function. So it might be that you can't make uh, some required substance. So for instance, if you have metachromatic leukodystrophy, you can't actually make myelin, which is the insulation that goes around the nerve cells to help them transmit their signals one to another. Or it might be if you're missing a, a, one of the enzymes that's in a mitochondrial, uh, in the mitochondria, that you can't generate enough energy 
And so because of this, you have problems with energy failure, and that can actually lead to cell death. Now, the other way that this can be deleterious is if you have an accumulation of the substrate. So all of these enzymes have a target that they process. And if you can't process that target and you don't have another way to do it, then what you get is a buildup. And so going back to your question, what's shown here on the left in panel A is a normal cell that's in culture that's taken from a patient uh, just a, that's a, 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 normal, a, a normal individual. On, on the right side, um, what we see is a cell taken from a patient who has Morchio A. And all of that white stuff that you see there is accumulation of glycosaminoglycan in the lysosomes to the point that they even start to burst and they cause gross dysfunction of that cell. So this also explains why many of these disorders have what we would call pleiotropic effects, or they affect lots of different organ systems, because the lysosomes in this case and all of the cells are going to have this exact same metabolic problem. And so again, using Morchio A as an example, patients with Morchio have skeletal deformities that can, re that can result in short trunks. They can have problems with spinal cord compression. They can have uh, malformations of their joints. And these are all of the primary problems based on the buildup of keratin sulfate in this case. But then they also have non-skeletal symptoms. And some of these might be secondary to the skeletal symptoms. Like for instance, breathing problems are because the rib cage doesn't form correctly and can be very constrictive in the, on the chest wall. But they can also have buildup of these glycosaminoglycans in the heart valves, which can cause heart dysfunction, hearing loss, eye problems, dental problems. And, and not for, for Morchio, but for other disorders, other LSDs, other paroxysmal disorders, other mitochondrial disorders, you can have involvement of the brain as well. So this presents a challenge because we have to try to figure out ways that we can correct all of these different manifestations. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, the other thing is characteristic of these kinds of diseases is that they tend to progress over time. And most of the time, kids are born and they seem to be developing normally and not have any problems, much like Mark was, was talking about with Ryan. And around the time that they're between one and five years of age, they start to manifest um, different symptoms of the diseases. And this can be true for a couple reasons. One is um, when you're in utero, it could be that mom is able to pick up the slack and she's able to do a lot of that processing for you. But the other thing is that there is a progressive accumulation of these storage materials that over time gets worse and worse and worse. And this can cause two problems. One is just the buildup in and of itself can become worse and then cause more cellular dysfunction and cell death. But the other thing is we have to remember during development, there are these critical periods during which certain parts of the body have to be formed in a certain way. So for instance, if you're building a house, the first thing you do is you build a foundation. If, you're, if you grew up right in Buffalo, you have a basement. If you live where I live now, you don't have a basement because it's in, so it's in Northern California and there are earthquakes there. But you have to put some kind of a foundation, all right? And then on top of that, you're going to build, you're going to put in the pillars that you're going to build the house around. You're going to put up the walls and then you're going to put in the windows. You're going to put the drywall. There's a problem with the foundation. It's really hard to go back and fix that and make everything else come together correctly. And so part, and this is another thing that's a, that's a real challenge in development, part of what we're dealing with is that if during a certain developmental epoch you don't have that right building structure put together, then that can cause problems that are then secondary down the road. All right, how might one think about trying to attack these disorders and treat them? Well, there's a lot of different ways that you could potentially do this. One is if you've got a substrate that the enzyme usually works on, some chemical compound that it modifies in some way. One thing you could do is, is to prevent that from building up is you could try to use substrate reduction therapy. So if you don't have as much of the substrate around, then you might not have as many of the deleterious effects. And this is exactly what we do with PKU. Okay, we limit the amount of phenylalanine that patients with PKU have so that we try to reduce that substrate to reduce the toxic buildup. Other things that you could do are, you could use bone marrow transplant, for instance. That's one way of replacing the enzyme. You give cells that have that enzyme and through cross-correction, which we'll talk about a little bit in a minute, um, they, you might have a, a good effect from that. 
You can also, in some of these disorders, depending on the mutations that you have, you may have an enzyme that still has some activity. And you could give some sort of chemical compound that could boost its activity, make it a little bit better, so that it gets you over the hump and it can still function near normal. Um, all of the, and, and then and one of the last things you could do is you could actually replace the gene itself. Give the body back, rather than, rather than giving the body fish, you teach it again how to fish so that it can create the protein that it needs. So all of these things are used to varying degrees. Um, many of them are, are, we now have the technology to be able to, as you've heard throughout some of the other talks today, now have the technology to try to approach these diseases that way, but a lot of them are still in the development stages. And the one thing that we've been able to do, and for the last 20 years we've really been able to do, is, is enzyme replacement therapy. So as Mark was saying, enzyme replacement therapy was first sort of conceived in the 60s. A guy named a Christian de Duvre, who turned out, to, he won the Nobel Prize for discovering both lysosomes and peroxisomes, suggested that we might be able to actually replace enzymes by giving them back from an exogenous source. Um, Elizabeth Neufeld, uh, in 1968, demonstrated something very, very important, which was this idea of cross-correction. So what she did is she took cells from an MPS a patient who had MPS1, another patient that had MPS2, and she cultured them in a dish together. And what she found was that over time, these cells that looked very abnormal and they behaved very abnormally started to normalize. And they actually started to act like normal cells again. And so she deduced from that that the cells were making the enzymes that the other cell needed, and they were somehow able to transfer that activity to the cells that lacked the, the enzyme, the, the other enzyme. And so this really formed the basis for thinking that if we gave enzyme exogenously, that it could get to different cells, because I told you, it's got to get to a lot of different places in the body, it's got to get into cells. This provided some evidence that that was actually doable. And then Roscoe Brady's work uh, was really seminal in being able to, to, to bring the concept to fruition. The last thing that happened that was really important was the whole recombinant DNA evolution. And what that enabled us to do is then take a gene to make an enzyme and put it into bacteria or put it into animal cells and force those cells to make tons and tons of protein. And that is really what made these enzyme replacement therapies commercializable and viable uh, to be able to make enough of them to treat patients. So as Mark was saying, there are a number of different enzyme replacement therapies that are currently on the market. Um, right now, there are 23 different clinical trials for 10 different lysosomal storage disorders. And, I, and those are the ones that I, that I focus on. There are also other trials that are going on for other sorts of, of storage diseases, proxosomal disorders, mitochondrial disorders. And so it's a really exciting time, um, I think, from all aspects to be involved in trying to I, identify and then actually create therapies for these disorders. Um, and so, once again, just the, the ERT goal, if we think about the cells and we think about uh, where we need to get these enzymes, if you look at, at panel number one, it shows a lysosome that has a whole bunch of storage material in it. And the way ERT works is we deliver the enzyme in some way, gets into the body, it is taken up by the cells, and then delivered to the lysosome, in this case, and then it's able to do its thing. Now, proteins have a certain finite lifespan, and so that's why we have to keep dosing at some interval. Sometimes it's weekly, sometimes it's every other week, sometimes it's monthly. It just depends on how long these proteins actually last and they're able to do the activity for which they're designed. This also highlights though, some of the challenges that we face when we're trying to move an enzyme therapy forward. And these fall into two broad categories. On the medical and biological side, um, delivery to all the affected body regions can be really tough. You know, if you have an enzyme that you have to get into the liver, it's relatively easy giving an IV to be able to do that because the liver is really good at taking up proteins and processing stuff. But let's say that one, the disease you're thinking about, like in the case of what I work on, MPS3B, let's say that, that actually involves the brain. Well, we've got, we've you know, five billion years of evolution has given us this fantastic blood-brain barrier to prevent pathogens from getting from our body into our very sensitive brain cavity. So it's really hard to get proteins in there. So we have to come up with another way around being able to do that. And in our case, we actually are given, just like in the, um, in, in the case of Batten's disease, we're given the enzyme directly into the brain to, to bypass the, the blood-brain barrier. Um, other tissues that are notoriously hard to affect are bone, 
cartilage is very avascular, so there's not a good blood supply, so it's hard to get stuff there when you're giving it into the blood. Heart is tough, kidneys tough also. So these are things that we have to think about when we're thinking about how we're going to attack these, these diseases. Another thing is the correction of, of symptoms after they start. Because again, if you're thinking about building that house, if you've got a problem with the foundation, it's hard to go back in time and fix it. Because you can't tear down the rest of the house to do that because you want to live in it. So this really highlights the importance, this is a little plug, highlights the importance, I think, as we develop more and more therapies of really thinking about newborn testing strategies and ways that we can ultimately get these therapies to patients prior to them ever developing symptoms. Because once the symptoms start, there's at least some level of damage typically that's been done. And an ounce of prevention is really worth a pound of cure. And then finally, uh, some of these therapies do have some side effects, um, as, I, as I'm sure people in the room know. Um, the most serious and most common of these are immune responses, which we can typically deal with, but in some cases, and, and usually in the minority of patients, it can actually limit whether or not they can actually receive the therapy. So there are certain ways that we can think about trying to minimize those immune responses as well. Um, equally challenging are the drug development and, and, and business issues that we have with, with bringing these therapies forward. The rarity of the diseases makes it really tough to develop clinical trials. As you, as you guys I know, know from personal experience and also from some of the other sessions that we've had. Um, and so really being able to find enough patients for a study to do the traditional drug development model and FDA and EMA sponsored models of how you do clinical trials can sometimes be very challenging. And certainly Ultragenics working on um, MPS7 is a, is a great example of that, how they were able to find enough patients to even put together a trial is really pretty amazing. Lack of natural history data. Um, because these diseases are so rare, in the past, uh, academics, and coming from academia myself, uh, it's been very difficult to have enough resources and enough connections to really, in a non-anecdotal way, be able to see how a disease progresses. And so it's, it's super important to know how the disease naturally moves, because if you don't know that, then you don't know whether or not therapy is going to work for it. And then finally, this is much less of a problem now than it was, say, 20 years ago. Um, historically, you know, reimbursement has been an issue because if you think about the average drug costing around $500 million or so, all told, soup to nuts, to bring it to market, um, being able to have a market that is large enough and having a reimbursement structure that will actually work to incentivize industry to be able to develop treatments is important. As I said, I think that that's, that's really come around, and I think that, that things are much more conducive to that now than they were in the 90s, for instance. So I just want to leave you um, with a note about how important it is uh, to have patients and families involved in the entire de development process. Um, and I can tell you, you know, I was a practicing child neurologist and I was a, a researcher for about 10 years before I moved to Biomarin last year. And I learned a lot about disease and about how things affect families just through talking to my patients and talking to their families. The bottom line is you guys know way more about these diseases than we do, and you can really help us understand what are the most important parts of the diseases, what are the things that we really need to focus on in terms of endpoints so that you can then develop treatments that are going to answer the questions that, that you have. Um, it's also important for understanding natural history. I think there's not only for recruitment for study trials, but things like registries. The Connect MPS registry, for instance, has already been instrumental for our program in understanding in a broader way from around the world what people are experiencing um, in their everyday lives uh, living with, with different disorders. Um, and then finally, from the, from the standpoint of the development plan, acceptable routes of administration. So when you're given a drug, like, it's great that we can develop drugs that you give ICV once a week, but if that's completely untenable to do that, then it doesn't make much sense to use that as a development route. And so working with patients and families to understand what makes sense and what doesn't, I think, is really important. The concept of the minimally, minimal clinically important difference. You know, what's the smallest difference in a measure that patients or caregivers perceive as beneficial? that would mandate, in the absence of troublesome side effects and excessive costs, a change in patient management. Again, this really helps us to be able to develop endpoints that are going to be relevant 
and that are going to be um, acceptable to you guys. Uh, and then finally, the patient reported outcomes. Um, not only is it is important for us to understand more about your perceptions of the diseases and, and how it is that you live with them, but it's becoming increasingly important from both the FDA and EMA standpoints. They want to have PROs that are incorporated into clinical trials to make sure that needs are being met. And so working as a partner to ensure that that happens really helps bring therapies to patients much, much quicker and more effectively. So just to summarize, um, enzymes are proteins that perform functions that are vital for development and for survival. Um, enzyme deficiencies lead to symptoms that involve multiple organ systems. Enzyme replacement therapy aims to treat these diseases by replacing the deficient enzyme. And then a partnership between patients, families, researchers, physicians, and industry is, and regulators is really essential um, to be able to, to do the kinds of things and deliver the kinds of therapies that, that we all want uh, for our patients. Thanks. Yes, we, we have a few minutes for questions. Hi, I wanted to thank you both for the excellent talks. Um, I just have one thing to, stay, to say. I, I worked for Biomarin for eight plus years, and I worked for Ultragenics almost that long, quite a long time. But one of the things that I don't think that's being um, addressed is because nobody really thought these patients were going to live this long. And they seem to be having a lot of socialization issues. Um, first of all, they, they want to work. They want to have jobs. They are having trouble getting hired. Some of them graduated, have graduated college. They want to date. They want to date. They're having trouble meeting others that, that want to go out with them. Um, and they're having problems cutting the apron strings from their parents when they like, they're grown up now. And I, I keep hearing this over and over again, and it's not given enough thought um, at Biomarin, Ultragenics, Genzyme, Shire, to help prepare for these you know, longer-term issues that, they're, that these patients are struggling with and families now. Thank you. Sure. I, I, uh, I'm in absolute agreement. This is, the, the, the good news is the, these uh, children are now adults, and that's thanks to the partnership of, of companies, that, all of them you just mentioned, and, and others. What, what's sad is what we've given them is, what I talked about earlier, is not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. They want to be a contributing member of society, and yet there are certain restrictions to make, make that so much more difficult than the rest of us. The weekly IV infusions, the travel to physicians, all of these things. Okay, I'm offered a job. Oh, by the way, I need to go to Boston for uh, some hospital visits in the next week. Those job offers come back very quickly. So uh, I think what's, what can be done is lean on the patient support groups within the community, uh, come up with answers. But most importantly, mom and dad, my wife and I need to step, get out of the way. We need to listen to what Ryan's perspective is. Uh, we can't tell him anymore how to think, which is too bad because... I, <laughs> But he needs to tell us what to think about not only Ryan, but his partners in the same community. They have a loud voice. We have to start hearing it within the uh, companies that support us and with, within the home. Yeah, I, I, yeah absolutely. I, I agree. Um, and I think that, that you know, in, whether you're in academia or, or whether you're in industry, you're so focused on developing the therapy itself and getting it out to patients that you forget that there's going to be all these other issues that are going to have to be dealt with later. And so I think um, to have advocacy groups and patients and families keep reminding us of that helps us to keep that at the forefront so that we can think about ways to, to help ease those transitions as well. Are there other questions? First of all, thank you. Absolutely amazing. Um, a quick thing to the social issue. So I'm the president of the Children's Tumor Foundation and we're focused on neurofibromatosis. What we have created is just a, a possibility for these kids to become the supporters of the next generation kids. And I think that is something that is really skyrocketed in our community that the, the, the kids that are grown up, so the, the, let's say the adults or the almost adults, they become the mentors of the younger kids. And then you create almost like an, an ecosystem that takes care of itself. And that is not solving the problem, but it helps a lot in pushing the younger kids up and having the older kids really being a valuable resource to the community. 
I have one specific question as a scientist now. How do you, how does Biomarine choose their disease focus? How do you choose which disease you're going to work on? That's a great question that's probably above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, historically, at least we have been very involved, as you know, in the, in the MPS community and, and, and looking at those diseases. And so thinking about, like, and thinking about, uh, diseases that were amenable to enzyme replacement therapy has really been our bailiwick thus far. Um, at this point, I would say that, like, I think a, there's a balance in industry between understanding the tools that are available and then trying to find applications for those tools. So I think that that now, because there are so many more tools than there were, you know, 10 years ago even, that there is a... Um, that people are realizing that we can attack other disorders. And so, uh, so I would say, again, it's a balance between what it is that you think is, is feasible in terms of the science and how you could apply it, um, and then comfort zone for the kinds of disorders that you have looked at in the past, and you have some sense of how they kind of move. Are there any particularly difficult enzymes or proteins to replace that you would say, like, stay away from those? <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay, the risk of getting myself in trouble. Um, I'm going to say no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We'll talk offline. <laughs> I'll give you some whiskey and get the real stuff. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, and I don't think we've gotten any questions on live stream. Um, thank you very mu much to both of you. Um, so... This concludes our morning breakouts, and thank you all for joining us. Um, <laughs> another round of applause. Uh, so before we head out to enjoy our lunch, which is generously sponsored by Pfizer, if you all could please jump on the mobile app and take our brief survey on the session. Um, and thank you again to the speakers today for joining us. <laughs>